El general Julian Thompson, oficial de los Royal Marines, fue durante la Guerra de Malvinas comandante de la Tercera Brigada Comando. Hoy nos recibe en su casa de Romsey, a una hora y media de Londres. General Thompson, even the Argentinians that haven't read your book are likely to have heard about its title. Why did you choose No Picnic for a title? Because when I held my orders to my officers before we sailed south, I said to them, gentlemen, it will not be a picnic, but I'm confident that we will win. You think uh, Argentinian forces were underestimated? I think that I, I didn't allow my people to underestimate the Argentine forces. Uh, there was a, a moment when I thought that the politicians were talking them down and denigrated them. And I said, listen, these guys are good rugby players. They're tough. Don't underestimate your enemy, ever. And I wouldn't allow any talk of them being underestimated because it's always a great mistake to underestimate, uh, underestimate your enemy. How would you describe the Argentinian soldier? I would say that he was a typical uh, conscript of the time. And the problem with conscripts and the Argentine army at the time was it was divided into two halves. There were the regulars, who were the officers and some of the NCOs, and, and the soldiers. And the Argentine soldier is perfectly capable of doing good work if he's properly trained. You would say that if the commander is good, the soldier has to be good as well? Yes. There are no such things as bad soldiers, just bad officers. Now, our soldiers and Marines were well trained, really well trained. And that was the difference. We were better trained. Not better people, better trained. But you know, in Argentina there was this criticism about the age of the soldiers. They were 18 and 19 years old. For instance, I have uh, heard that the British Navy had soldiers 17 years old. What would you say about this age issue? It's a, it's a myth. The, 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 the Argentine soldiers were no younger than mine. I had men who left England as 16-year-olds. They had their 17th birthdays down south. I had four at least. And so our chaps were the same age. Where we were, had an advantage is we had more regulars. What about the Gurkhas, the Nepalese Gurkhas? Were they engaged in battle on the front line or just they served another purpose? They never got to the front line because the war ended too early. Um, and they were used by the British Army all over the world. We've had Gurkhas in, in the British Army for, for years and years and years and years. Uh, we had them in Borneo and many places, in Malaya, and they're very good soldiers. And they had a reputation which was born of the fact they carry cookeries, knives, all right? It's, uh, that's a myth. They're not like that at all. They're well-trained guys. And in fact, I saw the Gurkhas attacking on uh, the, right towards the end of the war, I was standing watching them, and uh, unfortunately, the enemy didn't stay to, to confront them, or because they, they took off. But the Gurkhas would have behaved perfectly normally and perfectly properly had they engaged them. But at this war, the Gurkhas were not engaged in battle because the war ended too early. But they were also used as a psychological factor. Well, we didn't use them as psychological. They were self. It was self generated psychology. It was, it was, oh, two of the Kirkus have got knives, aren't they terrible? It was, it was generated by you guys who built up the Gurkhas as, as fiends and nasty people. Not by the British? No, no. Why should we? Because it was a factor. Uh, fear has big eyes. Yeah, but, you know, we know, I know the Gurkhas. I've served with the Gurkhas all over the world, and they're perfectly normal guys, you know? How would you describe the Argentinian fighter pilots? Brave. Very brave. The trouble was that the Argentine Air Force had not trained to fight over the sea. And indeed, the Argentine Air Force, our perception, maybe we're wrong, was regarded with suspicions by the Army and the Navy as being sort of playboys and, uh, and uh, having a different view of life, quite wrongly. 
And so they didn't allow, did you know the Argentine Air Force didn't know the war was going to start until three weeks before it started, because the Army and the Navy kept the information from them. Now here you have a situation where you have an Argentine pilot flying a single-seater fighter from Argentina all the way to the Falklands and back, navigating using a map, OK, not having any navigation aids at all, flying there, seeing the target, having to attack it, and having to get back before he runs out of fuel. We admired them hugely. They were very brave people. We admired them. Uh, there is a controversy about the attack on the HMS Invincible. Yeah. Uh, the two pilots that survived, they said they, they were briefed separately and their testimony matched. And there is also the fact that the Invincible came back a few months later than the rest of the fleet. What would you say about that? The, uh, dare I say it, the Argentines, you had a, a fixation about sinking Invincible. And in fact, it was never sunk, ever. A bomb never landed anywhere near it. Well, uh, the pilots do not say that yeah, it know, was they, sunk, but they wrong. say they reach it, and they say that they throw the bombs on it. Well, they might have thrown a bomb, they never hit a bomb. No, a bomb never hit, ever. Why it came back so late? Because it was kept out there to command the, f the, the fleet down there, because she was the flagship. In fact, there was no. There was, I know it's a myth. It's a myth. You don't believe us. We, it, it was never damaged. Never damaged. If you would hear the pilots, you will believe them. Well, I, I promise you, I know because I saw Invincible several times. It was never damaged. But even uh, at the time, the prince uh, that was aboard says that he was playing a game and he had to seek refugee f from an Argentinian attack. Oh, he might well have done. They may have attacked. I'm not suggesting they didn't attack, but they didn't hit. He was uh, acting as a sort of decoy, I believe. The official casualties, British casualties, are 255 men yeah. dead and uh, more than 700 wounded. Correct. Do you think these uh, numbers are accurate? Yes, absolutely. Because we had a, a very good system of uh, checking on our casualties. We, we had a field records office out there, which we set up out there, which uh, tallied every single casualty. So every dead man was brought back in a body bag and checked over by the doctor uh, and to, to uh, check on his wounds and why he died and the death certificate was produced. So yes, I believe every single one was properly dealt with. You know, what, 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 have, what have horrified us, I have to say, was that your soldiers did not have identity tags. You know what I mean by identity tags? Yeah. The little, like, dog tags. They didn't have them. Well, some of them. Some of them, but many did not. We did, every single man had, had two. And when he died, uh, one was left on the body and one was cut off and taken to the field record of and handed and that's his identity tag. And they didn't. In your book you talk about the footwear, the Argentinian yes, footwear. Yes, much better than ours. Why? It was proper leather. Uh, ours was designed for riding around in the back of an APC and it was, uh, I can't remember what it was called, it was uh, it was, a, it was a false leather, you know, it was, wasn't proper leather, it wasn't cardboard, but it was useless. A lot of people had their own boots. I mean, I had my pair of Greenlander boots, which, which I had used in, in Norway, and I had them properly dubbed up and they kept my feet reasonably dry. A lot of guys had terrible trouble with their boots. They were useless. And your boots were much better than ours because they were proper leather all the way from off the back of a cow. <laughs> and and we, there, there are several cases when Chaps were stripping corp what they thought was a corpse of the boots, and the corpse got up and ran off. <laughs> so the boots were a trophy? Well, the boots were nice. They wore them themselves. Lots of guys wore Argentine boots. If they could get a pair of boots off a dead body, they did, if they fitted. And what about the rifles? In some cases, they were better? You had uh, fowls, which are automatic rifles, uh, and ours were the same rifle, but didn't fire automatic. 
and, and some of our soldiers had things called submachine guns, which were useless. They threw those away and used Argentine rifles instead. The attack on Darwin Goose Green yes. was a necessary one for no. your strategic view? No. Why not? Um, because it was a self-administering POW camp. You'd lock yourself in there. I did not want to attack Goose Green. I wanted to raid it to give you guys the idea that we were going to come on the southern route. Well, actually, we were not coming on the southern route. We were always coming from the north. My brigade always came via Teal Inlet from the, from the north. So why did you attack finally? I was ordered to. Ordered to. The politicians? Politicians. Because they wanted a victory. So they don't care about the casualties? The, the story is, I know the story, because I was told it by the chief of staff, the army chief of staff, who was a friend of mine, who was visiting uh, Fieldhouse, who was the task force commander in his headquarters in Northwood. And he said to this chief of staff, who was a friend of mine, who told me this later, he said, Fieldhouse needs a, a morale booster. So I'm going to suggest to him that he orders Thompson to attack Goose Green. And the chief of staff said to him, you don't mean that. He said, I do. And when he went back in to see him, he didn't take the chief of staff with him in case the chief of staff said, you know, <laughs> said, you don't mean that, do you? And threw doubt on it. And it was his idea. What could have changed the course of the war? Against us? Yeah. The sinking of one of the carriers? That would have been the key, key, key thing to have changed it. That would have absolutely changed it. Leading to a defeat? Leading to some kind of um, a, an arrangement. That would lead to an arrangement? Well, it might have done. Might have done. Were the soldiers at some point hungry during the march? Uh, hungry? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, the point was that the biggest blow you struck to us was the sinking of Atlantic Conveyor, because that took to the bottom three of our four Chinooks and nine other helicopters. So we only had one flying Chinook with no spares or manuals. So when all the red lights came on in the cockpit, they had to decide whether they were going to go on flying or not. They went on flying. But it meant we, we had to walk. I remember when, uh, when I was making the final plans to move my brigade forward by air to Mount Kent, and a chap stuck his head round the corner of the CP and said, Atlantic conveyor has been sunk. And I remember a voice in the back saying, we'll have to bloody well walk that way, we? So we did. Now, what that meant was that rations took very low priority over ammunition forward and casualties back. So on many occasions, people went without food for two or three days. Two or three days? Two or three days, yeah. When, when two para got into Stanley, uh, and, and the, the surrender. They had a hot meal which they cooked using Argentine rations which they found in this house. Uh, and they poured into a, a pot and they lit the peat fired Rayburn stove. I remember I was in the house with them. And they, they had a meal, and it was the first meal they'd eaten for three days. Because war is always the hunger. same as hunger. Yes, it is. Well, Napoleon said the, said the, the quality of a, the first quality of a soldier is fortitude in enduring fatigue and hardship, bravery, but the second. Forty-one years after the war, is there a particular memory that is specially seared in, on your mind? Yes, when uh, I heard, "Sunray is down," and Sunray is the nickname for the CEO. And that was the CEO of H. Jones. H. Jones is down. And, and I had sent him there. Some say it was his fault. No. He d decided he needed, the whole thing had come to a, a halt. He decided he needed to give it a bit of impetus. So he, as the CEO, decided that's what he'd do. And I never criticize a CEO for doing that because he is the person in charge. He had judged that, and that's where he, he was right, I believe, and he died. But some voices are raised that he was reckless. No, I don't think so. I think that they are talking nonsense. Every CEO has to make that decision. And I always remind people 
historically as a, as a military historian, I know that a particular division fighting in Normandy in, in the Second World War in six weeks lost 12 commanding officers out of a total of 12 battalions, all right. So they lost every single man plus. And the reason for that was that the, the thing was not going well. So he had to be forward all the time. So you must be forward and seeing what's going on. And he may make a mistake. We all make mistakes. Perhaps he went too far forward. That was an error. It was not a, it was an, just an error of judgment. It was not recklessness. So you regret sending him in? I didn't regret sending him. I regret not supporting him better because he asked for more assets and I said, you can't have them. Had I allowed him to have them, might he, he might be alive today. What I should have done, because I didn't want to do the attack, was take charge of the attack myself with another unit, so I'd had two maneuver units, and also done what he asked, which was send some light armor down there as well, light tanks, which I had. And they'd have been through that position just like that. So in, in a sense, I blame myself for his death because I didn't support him enough. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.